Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Hope that you are all doing well and staying safe. Here is Myrna Ahmed, a senior petroleum geologist student at Matruh University. Welcome to the fourth and last session of our online course, Shield Evaluation, presented by special guest speaker, Dr. Ahmed al -Garhi. Dr. Ahmed is the director of the bio Profit Educational Project, and also he is an assistant professor at Marita College in Ohio, USA where he teaches production and completion geomechanics and unconventional reservoir evaluation and development. Dr. Ahmed holds a PhD and MSc in petroleum engineering from Texas Tech Technology uh, University. Sorry. In addition, he holds MSc in petroleum engineering, natural gas engineering, postgraduate diploma, and BSc in mining engineering from Cairo University in Egypt. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmed. So welcome, Doctor, and thank you for the time you have dedicated for delivering this series of lectures about one of the top and the most important topics in the petroleum industry. We highly appreciate that, and we are looking uh, forward to having you in future events and courses. Okay, don't forget that there are still two lectures on uh, 16th and 17th of uh, December with engineer Pietro Galli entitled CV and LinkedIn. Now, as uh, a reminder, if you have any questions related to the technical session, please feel free to uh, drop it down in Q&A section. Now, without any further uh, ado, Dr. Um, the mic is yours. Let's talk. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna, for the nice introduction. Uh, this is the last session of uh, the series of uh, lectures about uh, shale evaluation and development. And uh, as Myrna mentioned, tomorrow you will get uh, a lecture with uh, engineer Pietro Galli. It will be very, very uh, valuable, and you will get a lot of information you know, how, uh, about how to write uh, a good resume, a, a good CV. Also, I will teach you how to do a uh, great in, uh, job interview. So it is very valuable to uh, any, uh, you know, uh, any student or any, uh, you know, uh, engineer or uh, geologist or petrophysicist. Okay. So as a reminder, uh, whenever we say uh, shale evaluation and development, whenever I talk about evaluation, most likely the evaluation is more geology and petrophysics. So this is pure. Um, uh, faculty of science so this is i know that the audience today or, you know in this uh, class most of them they are attending uh, faculty of science so um, um the evaluation part of the shield this is your uh, should be your major uh, in the second part which is uh, development we are, we are saying organic shale evaluation and development so the development part mainly uh, petroleum engineering mainly uh, developing the horizontal wells and the hydraulic fracturing Okay, so we it is 50-50, uh, 50%, 50, 50 percent, uh, on the faculty of uh, science and the other 50% uh, on the faculty of engineering. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, before I start today's lecture, um, yesterday I got a question uh, about how to drill uh, a plug. Okay, we do plug and perf uh, and uh, fracking in the shale, and I mentioned there is many techniques yesterday. Okay, but uh, to be accurate, what is common here in the United States is to do is to use uh, coil tubing. If you don't know what is coil tubing, please go to uh, Google or YouTube and write coil tube or coil tubing in oil and gas. Okay, so we use coil tubing or coil tube to drill uh, plugs. <clears throat> There's some other uh, techniques like getting uh, a workover rig, but this is expensive. The easiest way and the most uh, efficient way is to get uh, a coil uh, tube. Okay, so uh, today I have a lot of information uh, for you about rock mechanics and uh, what we what we call geomechanics. And in uh, shale evaluation and development, we have a lot of uh, you know geomechanics uh, things. So please give me all your attention. Okay, so look to the picture we have. Uh, this is showing the stresses. This is a faulting system. If any of you attending uh, geology classes in the Faculty of Science, for sure this will be easy for him or for her. 
And whenever we say sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, this is just three principal stresses. And whenever we say one, two, and three, it means number one should be the maximum in magnitude. So each one has a magnitude and has a direction. Okay, so it is a vector, not a scalar. Okay, so sigma one is the largest, sigma three is the uh, lowest, and sigma two must be in the middle. Okay, so <clears throat> so uh, sigma v equals sigma one in the first case. We call this normal faulting system. There is a crack, big crack here. There is a, a fault, and this part to the right will start to slip downward. Okay, because this block is heavy and the overburden here, sigma V, is greater than the two horizontal stresses. So I have three principal stresses. One of them is vertical, we call it the overburden stress, and the other two are horizontal with a degree of 90 degree with each other. Okay, so if you look to the uh, camera, this is the two horizontal stresses, like this, like my, my fingers, okay? And you have 90 degree in the middle. And the one vertical, this is the weight of the rock, what we call overburden. So the principal stress is simply, it is overburden stress, it is a maximum horizontal stress, it is a minimum horizontal stress. Because the, the two horizontal stresses, they are not the same in magnitude. Most likely there is one of them greater uh, than the other in, uh, in magnitude, and we call it maximum horizontal stress, and the other one we call it minimum horizontal stress. In today's lecture, I will try to uh, teach you how to get the magnitude and direction of each one of these uh, three, because this is very, very important when you, when you talk about uh, hydraulic fraction in general, and also when we talk about organic shale. Okay? So, Back to, the, back to the picture, the top one, we call this normal fault regime or normal faulting system. It means there is a crack and one block, the left block will stay as it is and the right block will start to sliding downward, okay? So in this situation, I know that sigma overburden sigma V is greater than sigma H max and sigma H min. H max means maximum horizontal stress, H min means minimum horizontal stress. So I will call the overburden the sigma v sigma one in this case and the sigma h max I will call it sigma two and sigma three would this is sigma h min. Okay. Look to the one in the middle. This is thrust fault. Thrust fault or sometimes we call it reverse fault. It seems like the two blocks after the crack will happen, the fault will happen, the Block to the right will start to slide upward. It means the two horizontal stresses are greater than the overburden. So you can carry the rock and move it upward. Okay. And this movement, it happens over maybe um, uh, thousands and millions of years. So it is long, long, long time. Okay. Some of these faults are active until today. Some of them are not uh, active. It was active before, but now it is not. So uh, it depends on uh, what case we are discussing. Okay, so in this case, sigma 3, which is the lowest in magnitude, will be the overburden because the sigma h max and sigma h min, they are pushing the rock upward, moving, mm -hmm. carrying the rock upward. So it means the two horizontal stresses are greater than uh, sigma overburden, which is the weight of the rock. Sigma overburden means the weight of the rock. And you know, all the time the weight is pointing perpendicular to the earth, pointing to the core of the earth. So your weight, your body weight is pointing to the core of the earth, okay? The last one, we call it um, a strike slip. The movement of the rock will be parallel to each other, parallel. It will not, the block will not move upward, will not move downward. They will, the movement will be parallel to each other, okay? So the two blocks will move parallel to each other. So in this case, sigma two will be the overburden and sigma three will be uh, the minimum horizontal stress and sigma uh, two will be the maximum horizontal stress. So please try, do your best to understand these three uh, faulting uh, systems.
because without understanding this, you will suffer a lot understanding the geomechanics of organic chemistry, okay? Or understanding hydraulic fracturing in general, okay? So remember the three things we need to have magnitude and direction, okay? So this summary, this table summarizes how we get a lot of information. For the vertical stress, for the overburden, we can get it from integrating the density log. Guys, we do, when we do well logging, I will do a density log. If you integrate this density log, you can get the weight of the rock at any depths you want, okay? It is uh, something very easy and straightforward, okay? Also, I can get something about the density from the sonic and seismic, even before drilling. But it is better to get it after you drill and you do the wood logging, for sure you will run a density log with a gamma ray, resistivity, density log, and Newton log. What we call the triple combo, uh, density log will be one of these uh, things. Also, I need to have uh, a measurement of the pore pressure. Whenever we drill, I need to get a measurement of the pore, um, of the pore pressure because I need my mud weight to be uh, above this pore pressure if I am drilling over balance. If the mud weight greater than the pore pressure, I would call this overbalanced drilling, okay? So, to know that you are overbalanced or underbalanced or balanced, it means first you need to know what is the value of the pore pressure. So you should measure it even during drilling or you can measure it later. Um, it depends on uh, the reason why you want to do, why, why you want to measure that pore pressure, okay? Also, I can get the least principal stress by, or sigma H min, the minimum horizontal stress, by doing a leak off test, or extended leak off test, or mini frac, or less circulation, or ballooning. Leak off test, or extended leak off test, there are two tests. I may do one of them um, after I do, after I finish my uh, casing and cementing job. So I will do leak off test during drilling, to check the cement uh, job, how good is the cement job I, I did. Also, to get me an idea about what is what should be the maximum mud weight I will use in the next section of I will drill. Okay, so it's leak of test or extended leak of test. Both of them, they are very important for drilling engineers, okay? Many frag is a small frag job. We do it before doing a conventional frag job. Why? Because I need to confirm some design parameters. Like I get you the minimum horizontal stress by calculation, but the mini frac can get you exactly the right minimum horizontal stress. So mini frac is um, a better way to get a value for the minimum horizontal stress, for example, the breakdown pressure, uh, for example. Also, it will give you an idea about the leak off behavior. Also, uh, it can get you an idea about the closure pressure and the breakdown pressure and so on. Loss circulation, this is when you drill and your mud weight go to uh, a zone and the mud weight is higher than the pore pressure, so you start losing your mud at that zone. Okay, we call this loss circulation. You are circulating the, the drilling fluid from the surface, but at a specific zone, the, you start losing your mud. Uh, the, the mud weight will be greater than the pore pressure at that zone, so you start losing your mud. We call this a loss circulation. This is also uh, drilling. Ballooning, whenever you have a low uh, permeability formation and this formation start to take uh, some of the uh, drilling mud you are uh, using and after you stop circulating, the formation start to deflate again. So at the beginning, it start to take the mud and get ballooned. Then after you stop circulating, that formation will start to deflate again and we call this ballooning, okay? This ballooning can give me an idea about the value of minimum horizontal stress. But let me tell you, the easiest way I can use some calculations using the uh, Poisson's ratio. If I have the sonic, uh, the dipole sonic log, I can get the minimum horizontal stress and a good accuracy. Also, if you have the leak of test, this is great. If you have the extended leak of test, this is great. If you have the mini frag, this is great. All these things can give you a good estimate for a minimum horizontal stress. For the maximum horizontal stress, to get the magnitude of, a maximum, of the maximum horizontal stress, this is too complex, and uh, I need to do something called wellbore failure analysis. This is too complex technique, 
and it is hard to get um, you know an accurate value for the maximum hazard to stress but uh, the good news is that we uh, in most of our calculations for fracking or for uh, will boy stability projects we will not need an accurate value for uh, sigma h max we most likely we can use uh, some uh, good estimates or some uh, sensitivity study for uh, uh, maximum hazard to stress but to do it right you need to do something called Wilbur failure. And this technique uh, made by uh, Daniel Moose, he was a student of Dr. Mark Zubak at Stanford University. And both of them, they founded the company I copied this table from, which is a company called JMI. JMI is a part of Baker Hughes these days, okay? Also, uh, uh, to get the rock strengths, I can do, I can get some pools, I can do uh, rock, uh, testing in a rock mechanic uh, lab. Also, I can get some, uh, get some idea about the rock strengths or mechanical properties from the logs, mainly from the sonic log and density, also from the uh, drill cuttings and, um, be, you know, using the, analyzing the wood uh, board failure. There's a lot of things to say, and, and, you know, there's a lot of information here in this table. And we need to um, uh, discuss each one in more details. Okay, look to the picture to the left with the mouse. This is the first section. I dwell in a well. This is a second section. This is a third section. So in this well, it is a special case. I have four sections. Most likely I have a surface section. <coughs> then I have intermediate section. Then I have a production section. So most of the wells, it is drilled on three uh, steps, but this one is a special case, and we drill this well. Uh, this is most likely a deep water well, uh, uh, and this is uh, drilled in a four uh, steps. Why four steps? Because it was no way to drill it in three steps because of geomechanics uh, reasons. For you know the mechanical properties of that formation uh, did not give me the chance to uh, drill in three. Steps. This is uh, there's a there's a lot of things to, to say, but I know this is not a well boy stability class, so I don't want to um, tell you some uh, complex stuff. Okay, if you still uh, want to know more, just you can ask a question at the end about this uh, slide. <clears throat> there is a website called the uh, World Stress Map. Okay. This is an institute, I believe, in Germany, most likely in Germany, the European Institute. <clears throat> and they collect information about uh, the faults exist worldwide. So if I want to know the stresses, uh, the stresses in the Western desert, desert or at a specific place, I can go to that website and give them the location, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the exact location. And they can uh, generate a map like this and I can see the faults. So whenever I see a fault, like a line like this, it means this is the direction of most likely the maximum of interest. Why? Because this direction would be the direction of a direction perpendicular to the least stress. In most cases, this would be the maximum of stress. But I, I said in most cases, not in all cases. So to say it in the right way, let's say this fault will be the direction of perpendicular to the least stress. If the least stress is the minimum, so what is perpendicular to the minimum will be the maximum. Okay. If the overburden is the minimum, so the direction will be something perpendicular to the overburden, which is a rare, a rare case, not common. Okay. So to get the directions, I can use dipole sonic, a sonic log. I can use uh, analysis of a caliper log. I can use image log, I can use world stress map, I can use failure analysis. All these things can give me an idea about the direction of the horizontal stresses. If you know the direction of the minimum or the maximum, it means you know the other one because both of them, they have 90 degree with each other. So if you know one of them, automatically I know the other one, okay? Look to the last picture to the right. This is the mud pressure. If the mud weight is too low, so your formation will collapse. Your wheelbow will collapse because uh, the pressure 
the, the mud uh, generating, the mud weight generating, is not enough to support the wall, so the wall will collapse on you, okay? If the drilling fluid is too heavy, applying a big pressure, more than the resistance of the formation, so you will fracture the formation. You will stop losing your fluid inside the formation, what you call it loss circulation, okay? So look to the mouse, this is collapse. This is a collapse, okay? What you call it wash out, if we speak uh, developing language, or call wash out or splintering, but wash out is more common, okay? And the last one, this is fracturing, and this is most likely, this is lost circulation, okay? I want the mud weight to be something in the middle, not heavy enough to break down the formation, and not low enough that will let the wall board to collapse on me or to wash out on me, okay? So this direction of the fracture will be perpendicular to the minimum. So this is the maximum. Okay, and look to the wash out or the break out here. This is the direction of the minimum horizontal. So and my understanding to the uh, failure inside the formation, my understanding to the loss circulation or fracking the, the formation during drilling by mistake, or uh, wash out, can get me an idea about uh, the direction of uh, the uh, principal stress. I know all the time the overburden will be perpendicular to the earth, but I'm trying to get the other directions of the minimum, the two minimum. If you have any question about the slide, please uh, write it down in the Q&A section. Okay. Why the direction is important? Because all the time I will drill my, minim my horizontal wells with the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. Why? Because later, after you fracture these wells, I, need, I know the fractures by default, by nature, will be perpendicular to the minimum. So this situation, look to the mouse, I'm pointing to this picture. In this situation, I will get more contact area between the wall bore and the reservoir, and I will produce more oil and gas and water. So this well, or this technique, if you drill the horizontal section parallel to the minimum horizontal stress will be better, okay? If you drill your well, your horizontal lateral, or your horizontal well, with the direction of the maximum horizontal stress, this is a big mistake. If you do this, everybody will make fun of you. This is a stupid mistake. You should drill your horizontal well with the direction of the minimum horizontal stress. Try to remember this, okay? If I ask you which one is better, you should tell me whenever we, I drill the horizontal well with the direction of minimum horizontal stress, this will be better and this will give me more production. Okay, which one is easy to drill? This is a hard question. If you are interested to know the answer to this question, I know most of you are in, uh, you know, grade one or two, and, you know, in the first two years of uh, education. But if you are interested to know the answer for this question, please ask me this question at the end of the lecture. Okay, so this is how I will drill my well. I go vertical, then at a point I, I pull the kickoff point, I will build a curve, then I will go horizontal. And this horizontal uh, part, or horizontal section, must be going with the direction of the sigma H min, the minimum horizontal stress. And the hydraulic fracture will be perpendicular to that. So this is the direction of the maximum horizontal stress, and this is the direction of the minimum. Okay. Okay, how to calculate the minimum horizontal stress using Poisson's ratio, for example. So, guys, here is a sigma H min, the uh, minimum horizontal stress, how we, how we calculate it. And I need to get something called nu. Nu, this is Poisson's ratio. Poisson is a name of uh, one of the most famous scientists ever. He was a French. And poisson means fish in French. If you speak French, you should know that. Poisson means fish or salmon. Okay, so poisson is that famous guy. He developed a way to get 
Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio, it is a lateral strain over the longitudinal strain. If you have this core, the cylindrical shape core, and you apply a force from the top and bottom on it, okay? So you will deform the shape of, of it. Okay, so I will get the lateral strain and I will divide it by the longitudinal strain. And it must be something between 0 to 0.5. Guys, remember this down and write this down. If someone told you Poisson's ratio is 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 or 1 or 2, it means that he is stupid. He don't know nothing about anything in mechanics. Poisson's ratio must be something between zero and 0.5. So try to remember this thing, okay? Because some mistakes are not accepted. Okay, sigma V, this is a vertical stress of the overburden stress. PO, this is a poor pressure of the reservoir. Sigma T, this is a component of a stress due to tectonic. We can give it an average value of, you know, you, you can give it, let's say, a tectonic stress of uh, 500 psi, 1000 psi. You can give it an estimate, or you can do some calculations to get it. Okay. And alpha, this is something we call by its points. It is something we need to measure in the lab, and I have a definition uh, for it here in the bottom. And most likely, the value of it should be, you know, most likely it is something between 0.7 to 0.9, something like that. If you know nothing about it, you can assume it is uh, one, but you need to write this assumption down. You need to tell me about it. Okay. How to get Poisson's ratio from the log? If you have a sonic log, we are measuring the TDS and uh, the DTS and DTC, the delta time shear and delta time compression. We are using two waves we are using a compressional wave we are using a shear wave two types of waves okay and using these waves we send the wave and it go to the formation part of it will get reflected back and i have a sensor will measure the time from sending the wave and receiving the wave we call it the delta time shear delta time compression okay so to get the Poisson's ratio, it is 0.5 times the DTS over DTC or all square minus one. Divide this by DTS over DTC square minus one. You must get a value between zero and 0.5. Don't forget this. If you use this equation and you get it by 0.7, it means you did a mistake. So please go back and review what we did. Try to find what we did wrong. Then, after you get the Poisson's ratio, I will get G, which is a shear modulus. It is uh, the density log, and I have it from the, from the density log I have. This is the bulk density. This is the bulk, row B, this is the bulk density. And I will divide this by DTS, delta time shear square times A. A is a constant. A is a constant. Okay. After you get G, you need to get Young's modulus. Young's modulus equal to G times one uh, plus uh, Poisson's ratio. Okay, remember the Young's modulus I'm getting some, is something we call dynamic Young's modulus. Why dynamic? Because I'm getting this using the wave, using the sonic wave. So when you use a sonic wave, the dynamic, the Young's modulus I'm getting, we put it dynamic. That Young's modulus is not the Young's modulus I need to use in my calculation. What I'm trying to use is something called static Young's models. And there is no relation between static and dynamic Young's models. This is a very, very sad and bad news. Do you know why? Because I need to convert dynamic Young's models to a static Young's models. And there is a lot of um, uncertainty when we do this. There's a lot of uh, sources of uh, mistakes and uncertainties when we do this. The Poisson's ratio, whenever you do it uh, in a static or dynamic, it will not have a big difference. So Poisson's ratio is no problem. I will get it right from the sonic, okay? So when you get a core and you go and use, let's say this is a core, for example, and I go and test it in a, a rock mechanic lab, for example, and I get the Angus models, this is static Angus models. 
the youngest models I'm getting in a book mechanic lab. Whenever I do a triaxial testing uh, uh, of uh, a core, this is static. But the youngest models I'm getting from uh, a sonic wave, from the log, from the wheel log, the wheel logs I'm having, we call this dynamic youngest models. And you need to convert dynamic youngest models to static youngest models. And look, I am having some equations to convert dynamic to static. Count, count with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five. All these equations, which is maybe 20 something equations, are equations uh, claiming that we are they are converting dynamic to static. Which one of them is right? No one. All of them are wrong. All of them developed for a specific place. And this is not the place you are, you are having. If you want to do something for the Western desert in Egypt, you must develop your own correlation to convert dynamic to static as a Western desert. Especially, uh, also you need to um, do a correlation for a specific layer. If you are, uh, you know, developing a Burawash G or, you know, whatever the formation, for example, uh, in, in, in Western desert, Muslim desert of Egypt, uh, you should develop something for that specific formation, which is not easy. Um, <clears throat> let's say it is easy, but you need to have an experience. You need to have some experience with it. Okay. So um, right now I'm done with the basics of the mechanical properties. So let me um, uh, tell you before I, I, I leave this mechanical properties part. Why is this important? Because mechanical properties, I will use it in drilling. I will use it in hydraulic fraction. I will, using, I will use it to select the right frac fluid. I will use it to select the right propane. So if you don't know the mechanical properties of the formation, you cannot drill uh, in a uh, professional way. You cannot frac in a good way. Your job will be a total mess. Okay, look, this is a shale location. See, we call this place, look at the mouse, we call this place dwelling pad. Pad, this is a mouse pad. I put my mouse here, okay? So pad is a small piece of small location. Uh, I will use it because I want to minimize the damage to the surface. Most likely this place is maybe is a farm. Maybe we have uh, cows or buffaloes or whatever animals, and we have a lot of uh, plants there. So I want to minimize the damage to the surface, okay? So uh, this is a drilling pad. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is, first one. So this is hundreds of drilling pads, okay? And from each drilling pad, I, will, I can drill. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six. I drilled six wells from the same location using just one drilling rig. I used to check my students how many drilling rig I need. It is just one, I can use it. Also, I can drill more than the six wells. I can drill eight or 10 or 12. Sometimes we drill 12 wells from the same uh, location, okay? Uh, let me tell you something about the uh, fracking fluid. Okay, so uh, watch this first. Guys, if you are attending a hydraulic frac job in the Western Desert with uh, Halliburton or uh, Schlumberger or uh, Baker, this is the frac fluid you will see. This is the frac fluid we are using when we frac a sandstone formation, okay? And this guy, his job, we call it a uh, fluid tech, fluid technician, okay? 
In shale, I will not use this uh, cross-linked gel. This, this is, we call it cross-linked gel. In shale, most likely, I will use something else called slick water. Slick water is an invention by uh, George Mitchell. George Mitchell is a, a Greek immigrant. He was born in the United States, but his uh, dad and mom was uh, coming from Greece. And he got an idea to, instead of using uh, cross-linked gel, similar to that very viscous fluid I, you, 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 uh, you have just uh, seen in the uh, previous slide, he proposed that he will inject just water, just fresh water, in a very high rate, like 100 barrels per minute. 100 barrel per minute this is extremely high injection rate of a, of a frag job. If you attend a frag job in the Western Desert in Egypt, you will see injection rate of 20 barrel per minute, 25 barrel per minute, 30, 35 barrel per, uh, barrel per minute, but you will not see something above 35, 35 barrel per minute. But this guy uh, proposed to inject 100 barrel per minute. Okay, he had a concession in a place called the uh, Barnett Shale. Barnett Shale is uh, south of uh, Dallas, Texas. Okay, so one of his engineers told him to inject 100 barrel per minute, this will generate huge friction inside the tube. They said, okay, we can uh, solve this, we can fix this, we can use friction reducer material. We can use a chemical, add it to the water, and this chemical will reduce the friction. Okay. So now the recipe of a slick water is just water, and we add to it for sure uh, KCL. We add KCL to any water we are using in oil and gas. When you go to the field, you will notice that. So water plus 4% to 7% KCL plus something called friction reducer material. Okay. That guy injected uh, that new um, uh, type of water, later we call it slick water, and it made great success. They get huge production, huge increase in production, and now everybody in the United States adopting this technique. We are using stick water instead of using uh, a coarse linkage, especially if the shale is brittle. If the shale is brittle, I can use stick water easily. It will be super successful and very cheap at the same time. Money-wise, it will be uh, cheap. Okay. If the shale is ductile, most likely slick water will not be a good choice. Okay. Now let me show you what we are doing in shale here in the United States. We are using a technique called zipper crack. Guys, assume I'm, look to the mouse. Assume that I have just one well, not two wells. See here is well one and well two. Forget about well two. And I told you before, so Merna, do you hear me? Mirna, do you hear me? Yeah. I have a question for you, so get ready. Yeah. So assume I... Um, you. Okay. okay. Okay, I see the connection you have is not clear, but anyway, I will... So this question, this well, assume it is just one well, and I told you before that I have two teams working in the location. A company will do the pumping, and there's another, a second company will do plug and curve. So we have two companies working at the same time. Assume they are working in just one well. And I'm asking you, during the time that the pumping company working, what should be the second company doing? Merna, do you know what is the answer for this? I'm thinking. If I have just one well, and I have the pumping company pumping a stage, doing a hydraulic fracture in a, in a stage, the, the second company will do nothing. They are just waiting. Let's say me and Merna, we cannot work in the same thing at the same time. Let's say Merna is reading a book and I want to read the same book. So there is no way to read at the same time. So during the time Merna reading the book, I'm just waiting. Whenever she finish, I can start reading. Whenever I finish, she can back to reading and so on. So the, the, these two companies cannot work 
in one well, or cannot flow a one well at the same time. It means there is a lot of downtime. There's a lot of time that, that these two companies doing nothing and they get paid for nothing, okay? So an engineer developed an uh, amazing idea. He said, hey, instead of working in one well at a time, let's work in two wells at the same time. So during the time the pumping company will frack well number one, the plug and perf company will be preparing well number two. Then they keep switching. The first company will go to well two, and the second company will go to well one. Then they keep switching. So this shape they are doing, the pumping company will pump here first, look to the mouse, will pump in this stage first, then it will go to that stage in well two, then it will go back to this stage in well one, then it will go back to well two. So it, it is doing a Z shape or zipper shape. Zipper is that thing I have here. This is a zipper. Okay, so they are you doing a shape similar to a zipper. So we call this zipper fact. Okay, so this is zipper fact. So zipper fact, mainly we did it to improve the operation efficiency. And instead of fracking four or five stages in a day, I can uh, frack double this number of stages as a same day. So this will enhance a lot the efficiency of the operation. Guys, in Egypt, when we frack, most likely we frack with the first light of the day, very early in the morning. Let's say we start at 6, 6 a.m. in the morning or 7 a.m. in the morning or something like that, okay? But here in the United States, we are because we are not allowed to uh, frack during night in Egypt for safety. In the United States, we frack 24 hours. We frack seven days a week. We keep fracking until we finish. We don't care if it is day or night, okay? So the good news and the surprising news that most of the companies did the zipper frack, they reported significant increase in productivity. So you enhance the operation efficiency, at the same time, you get more production. Okay. Also, I want to introduce you a technique developed by Dr. Uh, Mohammed Solomon and uh, Halliburton. Dr. Solomon was my PhD advisor, so I know a lot about his work. So, something called alternate fracturing or uh, Texas two step uh, fracturing. If you are American, Texas two step is a name of a dance. If you uh, see the cowboys and you know um, uh, and cowgirls, they are dancing in groups together. We call this square dance. And one of the names of the dancing that the cowboys used to do, something we call Texas two step. Okay, so it is just a one well, just one well, and I will frag the first stage. Look at the mouse to see what I'm talking about. I will frag the first stage. Then I will leave a distance. Then I will frack stage two. Then I will move forward again and frack in the middle. See, this is number one. This is number two. This is number three. So I'm moving backward two steps and I'm moving forward one step. It seems like we are dancing. This is why Halliburton gave it a commercial name of Texas two step. It is the name of a dance. Okay. Um, 10 years ago, Dr. Solomon moved to, left Halliburton and moved to uh, work for Texas Tech University. And he was a department head of petroleum engineering at Texas Tech University. And one of his Iranian students, his name is Mehdi Rafi, he get a brilliant idea to combine the zipper frack with Texas to step. Texas to step has one disadvantage, that to do this, dance or this job, it is too complex. Operation-wise, it is complex. The tools you need is complex, okay? So he, uh, Mehdi Rafi, with Dr. Solomon, he, they said, okay, let's do two wells at the same time, similar to a zipper frack, and I will frack this stage, look to the mouse, I will frack this stage. Then I will frack a second stage on the same well. Then I will frack in the middle of these two stages, from a neighbor well. 
from adjacent well here. So I will track in the middle here, but from the neighbor, this neighbor well. You get what I mean? Okay. Um, Texas Tech patented this technique. So if you if you search for modified zipper track, you will find it patented by uh, Texas Tech for uh, Mehdi Rafi and Solomon. Okay. Then I joined Texas Tech in 2014, and part of my PhD was to um, enhance uh, the modified zipper track. Okay. I introduced something uh, new called optimized zipper track. Optimized zipper track. I will balloon these stages using different techniques. I will balloon the stages to similar to this is a piece of a rock, and I'm I'm pushing against this rock from the two sides, and you get a hammer and you hit this rock. If I am pushing hard and you hammer it in the middle, I will get more cracks. We'll get more cracks and more fractures in this uh, formation. If we do this, it would produce more oil and gas and water. Okay, so this is uh, now I'm using some support still shadowing, and I will explain what is still shadowing. So the first technique, this is zipper frac. The second technique is alternate fracturing of the crystal step. The number three is modified zipper frac. Number uh, uh, four is optimized zipper frac. So to balloon the stage. And this stage, stage one and two, most likely if you want to frack in the middle, the fracture will not be happy to go in the middle, will move to the other side. Because here there is two resistance, there is a high stresses. Okay, so here is high stress, here is high stress. So the fluids in the second well will like to move to the other direction. Okay. I'd like to move this. Uh -oh. Okay, so here, if I'm fracking here. If I'm fracking here, this stage and this stage, and then I want to frack in the middle, the fluid would like to go this direction. Why? Because there is a high stress here. The frack will not, the fluids will not like to get to go to, go to the zone. Okay, so this is uh, makes sense. So to fix this problem, try to frack three wells at the same time. Okay, so try to do it this way well one and well two and well three in the middle or well one and well two in the middle and well three in the other side and you can do this is the first stage this is the second this is the third this is number four then you frack in the middle so you will not have any problem in doing this now the question to you is do you think is it easy to frack the wells at the same time guys i will have a pumping company and uh, a wire line company with a crane moving the plug and perf from one well to the neighbor well. Okay, so this crane arm can handle up to three wells at the same time. If you want to frack four wells or five wells, most likely you'll get a problem because the crane arm is too short to do that. Okay, but for uh, two or three wells, there is no problem. So we can fix this problem by doing it three wells at the same time. Let me show you some uh, uh, simulation study. I simulated this uh, shell play, sweet spot. I have pay zone 12, 18 uh, feet, feet at the depth of uh, 12,800 uh, feet to, uh, to 15,000. I have a minimum horizontal stress uh, 9,500. I have minimum horizontal stress uh, direction 57 degree from the north. I have over burden stress, I have Poisson's ratio, I have average uh, permeability, so I have everything that the simulator needs. And we used uh, a simulator by uh, Schlumberger, its, it's name is, uh, we used Petrel uh, with um, uh, uh, kinetics. 
those plug and fold connectors, okay? So this is a normal zip effect, but I'm using, I'm doing it for three words, okay? This is the optimized zip effect, the technique I'm proposing. I will do it in a different way. This is a normal way. This is my way. Okay. Then, let me check how many minutes we still have. Then I will start to balloon the borders of these three worlds. This stage, this stage, this stage, this stage, this stage, this stage, this stage. I will balloon these uh, stages and I can balloon them by injecting more fluid by injecting viscous fluid, by injecting more propane. So there's different ways to balloon uh, these stages. Then I will frack in the middle. I will frack well number two, the well in the middle of these stages. Okay, I will show you that this will get you more production later. Okay, so I will, I can use a higher fluid viscosity. I can use higher propane concentration to balloon these stages. I can use additional fluid volume and fluid viscosity at the same time. I can use additional fluid viscosity and propane uh, concentration at the same time. I can use additional fluid volume and propane concentration at the same time. I can use fluid volume and viscosity. So I'm trying to try different scenarios. Here is, uh, in case nine, I will use additional fluid volume and viscosity and propane concentration all together at the same time. Here is a model we used. This is normal zipper frack. This is optimized zipper frack setup. Okay, and look here. This is the production rate. This is the production rates for uh, the nine um, uh, simulated cases. The lowest one is a normal uh, zipper frack. And all the other techniques of uh, optimized zipper frack will produce higher rate. All the other techniques of uh, optimized zipper frack will get you more uh, cumulative production. This will add a lot of production to you. Okay, here is showing the cumulative increase. So the increase from case one to case two. This is the increase. Point five. PCF, billion cubic feet of a gas, from case three to with case one, this is more than point, that point 0.8, and so on. So when you do case nine, you may get close to uh, extra two billion PCF over five years, because we did this, this is for five years, okay? Here's the additional uh, US dollars, assuming, um, a gas price of $3. The gas price now is uh, way higher, but at the time in 2015 or 2017, $3 for 1,000 cubic feet was uh, a good number. Or one, you know, uh, 1 million feet a year was a good uh, number. Okay. So you may tell me this is just a simulation if, and if we do it in uh, real life, it will not get you this. Uh, Great success. So Halliburton was Look Oil. Look Oil, this is a Russian company, famous uh, Russian company. And that Russian company, they tried the multi stage fracturing and they tried Texas to Step. This is why I'm getting you these two dancers doing a Texas to Step dance. Okay. So whenever they did Texas to Step, we get average production of 663. And the normal fracking, multi-zone hydraulic fracturing, we get 366. You can see this is almost double. And the optimized zipper frack is something very similar to Texas to step. So if we do it, at least I will get a success similar to Texas to step, but we uh, claim that we will do uh, better. Okay, so now let's explain why optimized zipper frack is good? Why um, uh, modified zipper frack is good? Guys, when you frack a zone, you are changing the stresses. Remember, when you frack, a, uh, you, when you create a hydraulic fracture, and now you want to create a second hydraulic fracture close to it. Remember, 
that you are altering the stresses, you are changing the magnitude of the stresses. The stresses are increasing. Whenever you inject something, you are increasing the stresses. Whenever you are producing content formation, the stresses is, uh, will be decreasing. Okay, so now we are injecting, we are fracking, so I'm increasing the stresses. So in a stage, there is maybe, I'm, I'm generating, or I'm creating 10 fractures at the same time. And each fracture will do, uh, will impact the second fracture. And the second fracture will impact the third fracture and so on. Okay, so we call this stress shadowing. This change in magnitude of stresses, we call it stress shadowing. Okay, it is, we get it from shadow. Shadow is uh, the zil. Okay, so this stress shadowing will add more to the minimum horizontal stress. It will increase the value of the minimum horizontal stress. So let's say I have the minimum horizontal stress is 8,000 psi. And after we frack, maybe I generated a shadow that increased that minimum horizontal stress by 100 psi. Maybe. Okay. So what I'm trying to do and optimize the pack is I'm trying to generate the maximum possible um, uh, stress shadow. Then whenever I will frack in the middle, I will get the maximum fracture complex network. Then I will get the maximum production possible. Look to this table. If you have low stress anisotropy, Stress anisotropy means the difference between the value of the maximum and minimum horizontal stress. Let's say the minimum horizontal stress is 7,000 and the maximum horizontal stress is 8,000. So what is the anisotropy? It's the difference. So it is 1,000 PSI, okay? So if you have a way to minimize this difference, whenever you create a fracture in a shale, it will produce better. What I'm trying to do in optimize zipper pack is I'm trying to minimize the stress and isotropy. I'm trying to minimize the difference between the maximum and minimum horizontal stress, make the difference uh, smaller. So whenever we frack in the middle, I will get more complex uh, system like this one. And for sure, I will produce more oil and gas and water. So this is uh, well known for all uh, experts in, in uh, fracking. And what I'm trying to do is something make sense, okay? We already know what is zipper fracking. So we already done with that. So to get more information about uh, this technique, please go ahead and uh, try to download this paper. Oh, I can leave you this paper. Uh, it's named design, the title is design, as design aspects of optimized zipper frack by myself and Dr. Solomon, and Lloyd Heinze, and Dr. Hashem Nasruddin, uh, Allah Hibham. Okay, also we had uh, engineer Muhammad Gabri from Khalda Petroleum uh, Company. Thank you very much, and now I'm waiting to answer your questions. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, can you hear me well? Sure, yes, go ahead. Okay, we have one question. Uh, Lester asks, what uh, are the chains of damaging the nearby formation using zipper fray? Say it again because I did not get the question. Repeat it. Okay. What are the chances of damaging the nearby formation using zipper fray? One more time. I did not get all the questions. What is the chances? I, okay, I, I can read it. What is the chances of damaging the nearby formation using a zipper frack? I'm not sure if, um, what kind of damage you mean. I have two horizontal wells and these horizontal laterals, these horizontal sections has maybe four or 500 feet difference between them, okay? So the fractures they may stagger together, they may interact with each other. Yes, this may happen. This may happen, but most likely this will not have a bad impact. A neighbor well of the, these two wells, most likely they will not damage each other. The damaging or let's say stability problems or uh, interaction problems, most likely you will get um, uh, only the advantages of this interaction between the two fractures from the two wells, but most likely there's no uh, damage will uh, happen. 
okay? I'm not sure if you are meaning, you're talking about formation damage or uh, a damage to the wool bore itself. A damage for the wool bore, this will not happen, don't worry about it. A damage for uh, a formation damage, um, again, this will not, will not uh, happen, or even if minor uh, formation damage will happen, the um, uh, impact of fracturing is more significant or more and more dominant. So the impact on productivity will be very positive and it will increase the productivity. Okay, I wish this uh, answered your question. Okay, there is another question, doctor. Okay, so there's a question from uh, Mohammed Zishan. Yes. Okay, which well is drilled easily? Okay, you have a good memory. Mohammed, you have a good memory. Let me go back. Yes. So I have two scenarios. I may drill with the minimum horizontal stress, like this one. And this one I'm drilling with the maximum horizontal stress. Guys, whenever you drill with the maximum horizontal stress direction, so you are pushing against the minimum. I'm moving in this direction. Look to me. I'm moving to this direction. So what is push against me and want to stop me from moving this direction is the minimum horizontal stress. Okay. So if I want to drill in the direction of the maximum, it will be easier for me to drill because I'm resisting the minimum. Okay. And if I want to drill with the minimum horizontal stress, which is the one we are recommending, you are, you are pushing against the maximum because the maximum is, is perpendicular to the direction. So this one we are recommending when we tell you drill with the minimum horizontal stress, look to the mouse, drill with the minimum horizontal stress, this is harder to drill. This is harder to drill. But guys, it is not a drilling story. Drilling is not a big deal. We will drill anyway. Even if we face some problems, it is not a big deal. We, will, we can handle this, okay? The well, this well will live with us 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, sometimes 70 years, okay? So I'm looking to the uh, well life, the whole life of the well. And I care more about the production, not the drilling. I can handle any drilling problem. So the answer is when we drill with uh, uh, maximum horizontal stress, this direction, the drilling problems will be less, but this is not recommended because the production will be lower. I care more about having more production. So please, please, please drill with the minimum horizontal stress direction, even if it is harder to drill, but um, as a, a production, it will get you more production. Okay, Muhammad, I wish this uh, answers the question. Okay, one more question from uh, Ahmad Muhammad Fathi. What is the reason behind taking the cuttings from the shell shaker and using the uh, hydraulic fracturing to inject them into formation like uh, agar? Okay, you are very smart, Ahmed, but you uh, actually, you asked the right person. I did this job for seven years to get the drill cuttings, mill it and grind it, making it dry it, making, up, making, it, making it a powder, mixing it with produced water. Then we find the right uh, zone underground to uh, inject. Why we are doing this? Okay, let me explain. There was a lot of countries, especially in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America, in Australia, they care much about the environment. Whenever you get oil-based mud with cutting, this is poisonous material. This is too poisonous, this is very poisonous material. Also, sometimes it has uranium in it. It has a radioactive material. Guys, I remember one time Gapco has a place in Egypt and they, they used to collect a lot of their cuttings. And there was a lot of, uh, not high radiation, but it was some uranium in it. 
Okay, so I will not be happy to sit as a manager and I have uh, uranium in my bag. Okay, so to dispose this poisonous material, such as drill cuttings mixed with oil based mud and this uh, radioactive material, the best way to dispose it is to return it back underground. But to return it back underground, I need to find the best place, the best trash can. Far away from fresh water, far away from hydrocarbon, far away from casing shoe. I don't want to break a casing shoe. I don't want to contaminate a hydrocarbon. I don't want to contaminate a fresh water I'm using. Okay? And this technique, we call it drill cuttings re-injection. Drill cuttings re-injection. Uh, Ahmad, I wish this uh, was a good answer for you. Okay, if you need more information, please uh, try to contact me in uh, uh, private. I can get you a, a lot of more information if you want to know more information about it. Okay, I think there is no more questions. Uh, yes, yeah. over. Okay, great. So, uh, guys, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to uh, teach you something. Uh, I wish it was uh, valuable. Don't forget that uh, Pietro Galli, by the way, Pietro Galli is uh, facing uh, COVID, COVID these days. So, but he is okay. He's in a well uh, health right now. And uh, tomorrow he will teach you something about how to write amazing resume. And after tomorrow, he will teach you something about how to ace a job interview. Thank you very much and uh, best of luck in your life.